This afternoon, I stepped down as leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition and leader of the Conservative Party of Canada following a Reform Act vote in our caucus. I believe that a strong, modern and united Conservative Party will help our country heal and help our country lead again. I pledge my support and unwavering loyalty to our next leader and I urge everyone in our party to come together and do the same. Erin O'Toole, no longer the leader of the Conservative Party of Canada at a caucus meeting today, 73 of the 108, 18 rather, MPs voted to fire O'Toole. This comes after poor results in the election and uh, some arguing that O'Toole's more moderate approach to conservatism did not work. So what now? Here for a special edition of At Issue, Chantelle Bear, Andrew Coyne, Althea Raj, and Elamine Abdul Mahmoud. Good to see all of you. It is not even a week since we last spoke, and this has already happened. Uh, it, it, you know, I don't know how surprising it is for anyone, but but Andrew, let's start with you on on your take on on how this unfolded. Well, the basic thing is, people will forgive you if you lose an election, if you take a stand on principle. And they'll forgive you if you ditch principle, but you win the election, but you to ditch principle and still lose the election. Uh, that's unforgivable in anybody's books. Um, but O'Toole was essentially a symptom, not a cause of the party's misfortunes. Uh, he, it's the kind of leader you get when a party is divided, doesn't know what, what direction it wants to go in. And the leader's trying to straddle between an, an extremist section of the party, and I, I use that word advisedly, that is out of touch with where mainstream Canada is uh, and the rest of the party. Uh, and the extremists have a large following within the party and indeed within the party caucus, but they are poisonous to the party's chances for actually winning an election. And he was not able to execute that straddle effectively. And that's basically why he was ultimately uh, thrown out. Chantal, I can see wants to weigh in. Chantal. I don't disagree with the diagnosis, but I may quarrel with the notion that the, the party is divided on where it wants to go. It's not that divided when you look at the, the last two candidates left on the ballot, uh, Andrew Scheer and Maxime Bernier, who has gone on to win nowhere and the race to succeed Stephen Harper, and or Aaron O'Toole, who only won because he portrayed himself as the true blue conservative uh, and played to the factions that uh, Andrew talks about. So that's two leaders who actually owe their victory to a critical mass in the party. It doesn't speak to a, a huge or a struggle uh, between one and the other. That, that That's an awfully interesting point, Althea. Uh, so I if the party isn't quite as divided as, as we may suggest, um, as Chantal is saying, I mean, it, it, does that mean that they have to think about how they want to return to government? Because probably if they're just playing to that section of the population, it's not enough. Well, they need to grow the party in the direction uh, that most MPs feel that it needs to go in. Um, you know, the challenge is that the voters of the Conservative Party are different than the membership of the Conservative Party. And if you have a very short leadership race, you are actually advantaging people that have a base already in the party. So Pierre Poiliev and Leslin Lewis, for example, like Leslin Lewis built an organization that was quite impressive yeah. the last time around signing up churches. And she has a strong base on which she can mobilize. And so if you have people that are already so ingrained in the party and you only have a few months, uh, any newcomer is going to be really at a disadvantage to try to grow the conservative tent in a more centrist fashion. Um, I think that that is really the, the core dynamic is that the membership of the party really are going in a direction where it is different from <laughs> where you need mm -hmm. to get votes in order to win and form government. So it, it, before we jump ahead to what happens next, what do what do we think, you know, Mr. O'Toole, or what do we think he did wrong here, Elamine, or what was the what was the one you know, the thing or the many things that that led us to this moment this quickly? I mean, to me, uh, Aaron O'Toole is kind of a victim of exactly what the Conservative Party wants, which is you know to appear to to appear to be a true blue kind of conservative, but then also aim for that mainstream audience and mainstream votership. Um, 
when he sort of did that switch, to me, I thought that was the plan all along, which is to say that is the only way you can win the leadership inside the party, and that is the only way you can win government outside of it. So there is this paradox. And so um, Aaron O'Toole himself is, is, is a victim of an unarticulated future direction of conservatism, which is to say, what is a conservative party in the 21st century? What is a conservative party in 2022, especially this post-pandemic? Um, that party has not articulated what those values are. Yeah. It's like it would it comes to me as impossible for Aaron O'Toole to himself define it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so Andrew, yeah. let me let me push you a little bit on what Chantal said. The notion that the party isn't divided, really, that that it actually has sent a signal about who it is and what it wants to be. Well, I don't think we should mistake uh, one part of the party for the whole of the party. In that last leadership race, a significant section of the party voted for Peter McKay. Uh, Aaron O'Toole was known to be an agreeable centrist within the party. He had a slight makeover in the course of that election campaign, but basically he ran to the right of Peter McKay, which isn't that far right. He could have taken the platform that he ran the leadership on into the general election campaign. Mm -hmm. He didn't need to make such an extraordinary pivot as he did. And in so doing, he ticked off so many people who might otherwise have been with him within the party. So the choices, this is the thing. I think a lot of people on both sides of the divide would like to frame the choices in this group of the leadership as being between liberal light or Trumpian insurrectionist. And there's a lot of room in between there for people who are solidly policy conservative, but can actually appeal to, to centrist voters. People aren't terribly ideological as a rule. General, general election voters aren't that ideological. What they want is moderation of temperament. But what they want to see is, have you come to your point of view as a, by a process of mature reflection, or are you just chanting slogans? Uh, we've seen in the past people can bring into ca election campaigns radical proposals. They can propose big changes in how yep. policies are made if they look like they know what they're doing and they're sensible and pragmatic people in doing it. Chantal? But if you're disconnected from the mainstream to the point where a majority of the delegates to your convention will not accept a resolution that says climate change is serious, where you need 30 percent of uh, members who are social conservatives to vote for you, and so you have to wink in their direction when most of the issues that they are pursuing are settled in Canadian uh, society at large, where 40 percent would have liked Donald Trump to win the election or believe he did. You have a party base that is divorced from the mainstream, and you cannot win without winning them over. Hmm. Althea? I'm not, I'm not sure I agree with that. I think there's an opportunity here. You know, with the PPC, you could carve off more extreme elements of uh, conservative supporters to, to Maxime Bernier and decide to focus on message. Yes, the social conservatives are a challenge. But frankly, if you had a leader that decided to pick a lane and stuck to it, like bringing saying they're going to bring forward legislation to ban third trimester abortions unless they're extreme meeting circumstances or something, I think that you could have, you can build a coalition uh, with the different interests that currently exist in the conservative party. And perhaps we should be talking about a conservative coalition because frankly, there are so many different parts to this party that um, you, you really need to have a, a leader that has a special set of skills to be mm -hmm. able to um, in, in make everybody agree to sing from the same songbook. But I think that it, it is possible and it, yeah. we will be in a fascinating leadership race to watch. Yeah, I mean, that was sort of the question I was asking people all day. Is this uh, a sign that the coalition Stephen Harper built is too fragile or is this a sign that Aaron O'Toole couldn't keep it together, Elamine? Uh, certainly part of the coalition that Harper forged is um, uh, maybe an agreement of silence or at least sort of being a little bit quieter on the social conservatism side. He managed to forge that agreement because he managed to sort of, you know, articulate a pretty strong economic agenda that is, you know, fiscally conservative and very ideologically solid. Um, with the, I think the deterioration of that, or maybe with the um, sidelining of that in terms of relevance, especially in pandemic economics, yeah. um, we, we, we're yet to articulate an alternative to that. So I think like if they have that program down, which is why I think Aaron O'Toole's approach was to develop that um, economic plan um, really well, like that's what he ran on, um, then perhaps the, 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 the social conservatives could be persuaded to be mm -hmm. a little bit silent and go along with the program. That did not happen this time around. Uh, like 30 seconds to you, Andrew. I just want to say that I, the, the, the process by which he was removed is noteworthy. Uh, part of his trouble was he was so high-handed with the caucus in, in pursuit of his various pivots 
And the caucus, I think, has put any future leader on notice that you cannot treat the caucus that way anymore. The power between leader and caucus has shifted in a very fundamental way. And that, yeah. I think, is whatever, whatever your party affiliation is to be cheered. Last word to you, Chantal. It also had the merit of being quick. And as someone who watched uh, opposition leaders uh, yeah. die slowly, a uh, quick death is immensely preferable. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, uh, we'll leave it there. But tomorrow you'll all be back. We'll talk more about who uh, the future leader could be and what it means for the future of the party. Thank you all for being here. Appreciate it.